Hi, and welcome to Harvest Bible Chapel, Kuala Lumpur Online. We hope that the following message will be a blessing to you as you seek to walk with the Lord in spirit and in truth. For more information about our church, please visit www.harvestkl.org or click the link in the description below. Well, good morning, Harvest KL. It's so good to be with you again, uh, though across the world that we can connect here in the worship of our God uh, through online settings, and I get to preach to you again. I'm so privileged uh, to be able to do that. I love you so much, and just kind of the great joy to be able to open God's Word with you, and uh, looking forward to do, doing that together here with you today. Uh, so the most important thing we'll say today, open your Bibles. Open your Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 1 uh, this morning. We're going to continue looking at the topic of hope that we begin looking at at the beginning of the month and has been preached a couple different times today from 1 Peter chapter 1 is where we're, we're going to look uh, this morning. And so I want to begin with a question, uh, just as a simple question. If, if somebody were to come up to you and ask, how do you know that you were born? What would your answer be? Well, I was thinking a lot about that. I realized I could bring my birth certificate and I could show them that on January 12th, 1977, I was born and it has uh, everything officially signed. And, and, and if somebody were to ask me, how do you know that you were born? I could carry a birth certificate around to show them that. But that's, that's not how we do it, is it? How do you know that you're born? Well, you see and you hear, and you taste, and you smell, and you're hungry, and you breathe, and you say, I know I'm born because I'm alive. This morning, I want to talk to you uh, around one topic. Write this phrase down. God has caused me to be born again to a living hope. How do you know that you've been born again? How do you know that you have a living hope? We're going to look at that here today, and in that, following the theme for this year, we want to learn how to rise in our hope. Now, we're going to be doing, uh, over the next couple of months, we're going to change the topics a little bit, and and so starting in March, we're going to learn what it means to rise with our head, and then we're going to learn uh, the following month how to rise with our heart and how to rise with our hands, And, and so this theme of rising is going to continue throughout the year, and yet what I find is that it's so important that we get this first thing, this idea of hope, fully solidified in our, in our understanding if we're going to truly be able to rise in our head, heart, and hands. And so from John 14, 31, you know the theme verse, rise, let us go from here. It's a command from Jesus. It's difficult if you don't have hope. We talked about that last week. Um, But today we must know that we are fully alive and and the hope that that brings, that's going to be the foundation for all of these other things. And so if you remember, we were talking about hope and how it's this full assurance, this confident expectation of a good future. And and really, I'm trying to answer in these two sermons, last week and this week, uh, three questions. We answered the first two last week. The first question was, uh, what is hope? And the definition that I gave you is a confident expectation of a good future. That means that you are secure, you're assured, you're confident, you're certain about what the future is, which seems bonkers because we know our human limitations. Like, I don't know what tomorrow holds, let alone what an hour from now is really going to be. 
I mean, there's regular rhythms and patterns of life, but do I really know what's coming next? Like we are finite in a way that doesn't have that ability, but finite humans, we learned last week, can have hope. They can have full confidence, full expectation uh, about what the future is if we understand uh, that we aren't using the word hope in the normal, ordinary way. Now, I hope it doesn't rain today. We're uncertain if it will rain today or not, but the biblical way that it uses hope is that there's certainty about what's going to happen. And so I pointed you to the place that you can look to know and have assurance. Uh, it's not in yourself, but it's, it's really a hope in God, in his faithfulness and his promises and his character that has never failed. And when we see what God says, we can know with confident expectation that for sure is going to happen in the future. And so that's what hope is from a biblical definition. We, we then asked the second question last week, why can we have hope? And, and really, do you remember what you should say here? Why should we, why, when, when we're asked, why do you have hope? You should say it's because of grace. We learned that from 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 16, where it tells us that God is the one that gives us this good hope because of the grace that, has, that he's given to us. And so we took a look at that. Grace, by the way, is God's decision to choose and bless his people without respect to their works, which, which is such good news, right? Because if you were to add up all my good works and all my sinful things and do an accurate assessment of it, I would be greatly in debt. Every one of us is. But God's free goodness to those, it, it, grace is really God's free goodness to those who have no claim on it, no right to deserve it, and yet he gives it to us anyway. And so we looked in that passage, we went back to verses 13 to 15, and we see a track of how salvation unfolds and happens. We see that we're chosen by grace. We're called by grace. We didn't do anything to deserve God wooing us and whispering and calling us into relationship with him. But that's what happened. He sanctifies us by the Holy Spirit through grace. He helps us believe the truth by grace. We couldn't do it on our own. We need him to bring that in. We come to the spot where we see we're going to be future glorified with grace. And I can be just as confident about the future glorification that he's going to give me as I am about the fact that he chose me and called me in the past. Grace, we found last week, also does not sweep sin under the rug. So I have a bunch of works that I can present to God and say, here, here God, this is, these are my dirty rags. These are, this is the best I've done, but they're, they're complete failures to your holiness. And, and, and God doesn't take that sin and just kind of ignore it and sweep it under the sin. No, instead, God sent his son into the world to die for sinners. And then Christ rose from the dead and, and became the head over God's family, over his church. So we know right now Jesus is sitting on the right hand of God in the throne room. And we know that he's sitting as the head of the church even right now. And that he's our savior and Lord and our trusted uh, king. So grace creates this incredible good news, this gospel that we are able to share with others. The, the, grace is, uh, the, good, the gospel is really the good news that Jesus Christ died for sinners, rose overcoming sin and death, and that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name, according to Acts chapter 10, verse 43. Grace gives hope by, by creating the gospel message that was proclaimed to you at some point if you're a believer and that's what you believed in, or it's what is being proclaimed to you right now. If you haven't trusted Jesus, we're going to see the gospel a number of times today. Be listening for that. In all of this, we can confidently say that without hope, when it's just uncertain desire, I hope it doesn't rain this afternoon, we, we don't have the certainty if it, if it will or will not. And, and, and when it comes to spiritual things, then we don't have a foundation if we are going to be able to rise and obediently follow Jesus as he is calling us to. We're not going to be able to, to, to rise with our head and with our heart and with our hands to serve him. We're not going to be able to live the way God designed us to live. But with hope, with hope, we have confident assurance that our future is secure. 
and that God's promises will come true and that he, he lovingly has brought us into his family and he's going to take care of us and there's nothing that's going to overcome us in that. Oh, there still might be pain. There still might be suffering. There still might be some death in this life, but there is a future confident hope uh, about eternity that we have that will allow us to endure even those things, those temporary things that are happening right now. And that's going to power us to be able to rise and obediently follow Jesus Christ in every part of our life. So I want to show you a text of scripture to, to uh, uh, really root us in these two answers to the two questions about hope that we've already had. And it's going to also uh, bring another question to the front, and we're going to answer this question throughout the whole time here. It's in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 to 9. Let me read it together. And then we'll take a little bit further look in depth in what's going on here. So here it goes. First Peter chapter three, I'm sorry, chapter one, verse three. It says, blessed be the God and father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and undef un unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Wow. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it's tested by fire, it may be found to result in the praise and the glory and the honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with a joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Today, I want to take a few minutes to examine this text and, and, and to make some observations, to kind of do a little bit of a Bible study together with you. And then I want to raise the question that I think this text really gives a solid answer to, to help us understand what it means to live out a life that is a living hope, that, that we can rise and live a living hope type of life because we get the answer to, to how this actually happens. And so, Let's make some observations from the text here this morning. Let's just look at verse 3 again. Uh, this is actually kind of the key verse of the whole paragraph, and, and we're going to come back and we're going to take a longer look at it in just a moment. But let's just make a couple of observations. Number one, uh, it says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Notice this, we're, we're talking here, this verse is telling us that there is a living hope and the theme of the message is all about hope. And the theme of this month's preaching has been all about hope. And so you see how important this passage is. Like if you're going to understand what the Bible says about hope, you need to understand 1 Peter chapter 1. Because it says that, that he has caused us to be born again to a living hope. We have this living hope. If you're a believer of Jesus Christ, we've got to understand what that actually means. But, but really what I want you to note in this verse is before the topic is announced, before we can even get to what Peter wants to write to us about, he can't help himself but praise the living God, praise the Father for what he has done. This is the right place to start when you study God's word. When you do a Bible study, start with the worship of God. Look here. It says, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, exclamation point in my English Bible. What that's trying to show here is that Peter is already in full-blown worship as he's writing this letter to the audience. And he's saying, listen, there is something so good, I can't help but just exalt the Lord right now. Before I even tell you what I'm going to talk about. So, so really, what is the reason that Peter is praising God so fully, so on fire with praise right here before he even gets to the topic of what he's talking about? Why do you think that is? Just think about that. What's the reason for Peter's praise? Well, we're going to come back to that. 
little cliffhanger here. We're going to actually, the second part of the message, I'm going to just take us through really a clearer understanding of this verse. But let's let's keep going. We understand that Peter is praising up around this topic of this living hope. And then let's look at verse 4 and 5 again. It says, It says, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed at the last time. So number two here in in verses four and five, a sure inheritance. That's really what these two verses are talking about. That there is a confident, sure inheritance that, that is being discussed here at this moment. So what is an inheritance? What's your understanding of what an inheritance is? So I'm the oldest son in all of, all of my siblings. And so uh, my parents a couple of years ago came to me and said, um, Nate, we want you to know as the oldest son, one of your duties is that when we pass away, that you are going to have to uh, take care of our, what's called our estate, our, our belongings, our property, and figure out where it all goes. And, and they've written a will. And in, their, in the will, they've, they've written their desire for where their possessions will go. And so I'm one of four children and, and everybody has different things that have been written into that, that's our inheritance. It's, it's what a parent passes to the next generation when they die. Th- this inheritance, uh, many times, it's, it's, uh, it's something that we see over and over in the stories of the Old Testament where there are these inheritance that are passed down. And uh, many times it's an important part of an economic system. And so in all of that, we see that inheritance just simply is the, the possessions that a, a parent has being passed down to the next generation. You think about that. It says here that Jesus has caused a living hope in us through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance. God the Father wants to pass down to his children, you and I, what he possesses. Now listen, God's not going to die, but he's already giving that to us. And so when we see here, it's important to look at the five descriptions of this inheritance. I think you'll get excited about the inheritance that you're going to be given when you understand these five things. Notice here, it's just the next descriptions to an imperishable inheritance. So imperishable means it's not going to rot. It's not going to deteriorate. Well, that's great news because when my parents, if they were to give me their house over the course of a number of years, it's going to, it's going to be perishable. The, the, the house is going to fall down. It's, it's eventually not going to be there, but that's not the spiritual inheritance that we've been given. It's imperishable. It's never going to rot. It's never going to deteriorate. Next, it says it's undefiled, meaning it's pure. There, there's no stain in it. There, there's nothing wrong with it. It's it's a hundred percent the best it could possibly be when when it's being given to us. Three, it says unfading. Here's I was thinking about it. There's a number of ways to describe it, but I just said it, there's a follow through to the end. There, there's full momentum. It's not going to slow down and peter out, and then there's really nothing left at the end. The gas pedal is fully to the floor, and you're going to get it when it's in the best shape possible. Then it says that it's kept in heaven. It's, it's, it's how I thought about it. It's, it's in the safe. So some people, they keep their valuable belongings in a, in a locked cabinet or in a safe of some sort, right? It's, it's kept in heaven. It's kept in the safe. It's, it's in the most secure place. It's where God dwells. And so we see this inheritance kept in a safe place. And then finally, it says that he's guarded by God's power through faith. How powerful is God? I mean, I don't even really know how to describe the answer to that question, right? Other than the most powerful being in the universe. It's hard to really make that tangible, but, but the most powerful individual in the universe is the one who is guarding this inheritance for you. So it's safe. It's secure. When we say that we can have a confident expectation about the inheritance that is being given to us by God the Father, we understand that he's guarding it and he's protecting it in heaven. It's unfading. It's undefiled. It's imperishable. Like, this is an incredible inheritance. But what is it? What is the actual inheritance? Well, it says right at the end of verse 5, it says, uh, through faith for salvation ready to be revealed at the last time. Our inheritance is our salvation. It's the most precious thing that we could ever have, the salvation of our souls. And so you think 
about this. I, I think a lot of times we were so consumed with the things of the world and the concerns around us and the problems going on and the things that are that just kind of catch our attention that we fail to remember how precious our soul is, how precious our being is. Well, if I were to ask you, what is the biggest need in your life? Well, earlier this week, I would have told you I, I, my biggest need was I was trying to find a school for my kids. And there was another day I was trying to say, I would say, it's, I'm trying to find a place for my family to rent and to live. Like those are the things that are on the top. They're always on the front of my mind, but, but that's not actually true. My biggest need is the salvation of my soul. It's the most precious thing. And so I struggle. I struggle to believe a lot of times that salvation is my biggest need. You might be struggling with that as well, right? Just consume so much with the, what's going on right now and what's current, and it's, it's difficult to think in those terms. But when you begin to see the inheritance that God gives us is this salvation, it's the best thing that could ever be given to us. That's the terminology that we have to give. I think about it in this way. My perfect Father in heaven knows what I need most, and he's given it to me as an inheritance. It's my salvation. So we continue our just study through this paragraph of scripture here. And, and, and let's look at the next section, verses 6 to 9. And I would just write this over it. Rejoice even in present sufferings. It says here in verse 6, in this you rejoice. So there it is, rejoice, right? In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials. Man, why is there suffering in this world, right? Why do I have to go through this difficulty, this frustration, why can't God just make it right? Seven, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in the praise and glory and honor of the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with a joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. One reason that God allows suffering is said right here in, this, in these verses. It's very clear. He says it, it tests if your faith is genuine. It, it helps measure in your life. You can see where your standing is, where your relationship with God. What is your faith right now? Many times it is, it, it, most of the time, it's most clearly seen through trials, suffering. Tested faith, note, notice, also results in greater worship. I mean, the, the whole verse is, is, it tells us to rejoice at the beginning. By the end of verse 9, your heart's ready to explode. Like, I, as I was reading it, I was ready. Let's just start singing some worship songs because of how awesome this is. In, verses eight, in verse 8, notice that genuine faith is marked by love and belief and rejoicing. That's what these verses say. Why? Why can there be love and belief and rejoicing that shows a genuine faith, even in the midst of difficult moments, our darkest moments, our most difficult moments? Why is that? It's because what matters most is secure. I can not only endure difficult things in life, but I can find joy when I know that the thing that matters most is secure. And that's what these verses are saying. My salvation my soul, my relationship with my heavenly father, three different ways of saying that that's the most important thing. And I don't have to doubt or wonder or be uncertain as to if that's actually in play or not, or if it's secure, it is secure. And that's why there can be worship. But what's the problem with that? The problem is that as I go through each and every day, I forget this. I forget what the most important thing is and that that is secure. And so I, I, I get bombarded by the things around me and I begin to think, actually, you know what? Uh, I'm really struggling with, with my kids' education and where we're going to do that. I'm really struggling with my housing and where we're going to do that. I'm really struggling with all the uh, management of all the different transition things. Th those are real things going on in my life right now that can easily block out uh, this kind of hope. So the problem is I don't have this kind of hope that's being described here in these verses. It's really more of an ordinary hope. Like, I, I hope that's true, and it, like, I hope it doesn't rain. I'm, I'm, not, I'm uncertain. And when I'm uncertain, I, I, that's really 
a problem, a problem for why I cannot rejoice and worship God as I should. That's why I read the first phrase in, in chapter 3, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And I'm kind of like, it just doesn't really bump my emotions yet. When I'm uncertain, salvation loses its value because I think other things are more valuable. I, 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 when I'm uncertain, suffering overwhelms me and I don't act in faith. I, I act in selfishness instead. I, I can't actually rise. Remember, we're trying to learn how to live as followers of Jesus. He told us to rise and come with him, and, and, and I don't do that. So how can I hope? That's really the third question. Remember, I said that we we're going to look at three different questions over two Sundays, so we've answered the question, what is hope, and why can we have hope because of grace? Now, how? How do I access hope? How do I actually get that hope? Well, I believe these verses actually tell us quite a bit about how to do that. But I think we need to maybe hear a little bit of a story to really make the transition and get going here. So once there was a man. He, he was a man who had been very successful in life. He was wealthy at the moment. He had a family. He had everything that you're supposed to have at his age. But suddenly tragedy struck and he, he, he began to lose control of all of those things. One day he walked out of his offices in a very posh part of the town and he began to walk. He was walking wondering what was going on in his life and he walked from the good section of town past a beautiful housing development with a house on a hill. He, he walked past all the nice houses to the bottom of the hill until he got to the place where the houses got less and less impressive and ultimately to the place where it was a shanty town. He was in the slums. And it fit his feelings because he was depressed and anxious and dissatisfied with all that was going on in his life. He was consumed with worried and there were knots being tied within him. He was in suffering and despair. He was even considering ending it all. As he was walking, his head sunk lower and lower to the point where he wasn't really looking where he was going when suddenly he bumped into somebody. He bumped into a bum. He could tell he was a bum because he didn't look clean. His clothes, well, they were torn and there wasn't much about it. He was a bit smelly, hadn't brushed his teeth in a while, don't know when he last had a bath. Like he, this was a man clearly not being treated well in life. Dirty, smelly, unkept. But his disposition was different. There was something about him as he, as he bumped into him, he was like, whoa, whoa, and he looked up and he sees this unkept man, but, but he looks at him and, and he sees something different about that man than he saw within himself. He sees within the disposition of the bum, he sees contentment and he sees a, a joyfulness in his eyes, a satisfaction in the relaxed nature of his face. He seemed whole. And so he said to the man that he'd never met before and would never normally associate with, how is it that you can be so calm? How is it that you seem so satisfied, that you're content and joyful? Because I'm looking and you do not have much. And your house is but a, a, a shack. How is that possible? And the man answered and he said this, I may be living in this shack now, but I'm being given the house on the hill. You see, this man who didn't have anything in life had a confident hope because he knew of the inheritance that was being given to him. And so while life was not treating him well in the moment, he had the ability to be content and joyful and satisfied and whole, unlike the rich man who seemed to have everything in the world but was losing it all. Maybe a small parable of why we need to find out how to have hope. How can I hope? How can I have a confident expectation of a good future? The answer is in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3. But for me to tell you this answer was going to require some significant surgery. <laughs> Are you ready for some surgery in your life? So I was reading about John Piper and, and one of the things that he was, uh, an illustration he talked about, he said, there's a, there's a surgeon that is eager in this passage. 
and, and that's the grace he, he's willing to heal. There, there's an instruments that are prepared. It's the gospel uh, that, that of Jesus Christ, of his death and resurrection. But, but something is missing. There, there's a doctor that's eager, instruments that are ready. But if something else doesn't happen, the patient will die of the heart disease of sin. Today, I want to show you the procedure that needs to be performed on each of us called new birth. The doctor is eager. The instrument is prepared, but the procedure must happen. The chest has to be opened. The disease has to be cut out. The blockages must be removed or else we do not get new life. This is super important. You can believe in the doctor, God. You can believe in the instrument to prepare it, the gospel. But, but, if you, but you can still die of heart disease unless you undergo the procedure of getting a new heart, a new life. Without it, there's no hope of eternal life. So let's undergo this heart procedure called regeneration. Are you ready for that? Say, I'm ready. All right, we're ready. God has caused me to be born again to a living hope is the idea. Here, write this down. Number one this morning, believe that regeneration is necessary, not optional. Sometimes we think that we don't need God to make new life in us. We think it's an optional thing. And today we're going to see that it's absolutely essential. It's, it's not optional. It's necessary. But first, let me just define what this word regeneration is. I've used it once or twice already. And I want to make sure we understand what is being said here. So it says that we are in verse three here, uh, that according to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope. That, that's the surgery, the surgical procedure that is needed, this, this idea of being born again to this living hope. We are born anew is really what it's saying. It literally says, he caused us to be born anew. It's life-giving procedure, surgical procedure that's being given. And the Bible uses a word to describe that procedure called regeneration. Matthew 19, 28, Titus 3, 5, or other places that it's used in that way. And it simply means new birth or rebirth. It's to, to generate is to give birth to. To regenerate is to give birth again. But how? How is it that once I'm born, I am to be reborn? Well, that was the question of a man in the Bible named Nicodemus as well. And so I want us to look at the example of Nicodemus to help us understand this. If you turn in your Bibles to John chapter 3, we see his story. And in John chapter 3, we see his interaction. And in verse 3, it says, uh, Jesus answered Nicodemus, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. So this verse tells us that regeneration is necessary. Jesus is actually saying, unless somebody is born again, he doesn't get eternal life. He doesn't get the living hope, the, the assurance of that in the future. And without it, we will not see God's kingdom. Why is that? In verse 6, Jesus uh, uh, tells us, verse 6 and 7, it says, That which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I say to you, you must be born again. Jesus, in other words, is saying that the reason we must be born again is that mere flesh does not inherit the kingdom of heaven. Now, we're flesh only. And until we're born again by the Holy Spirit, we do not have this opportunity. If we're going to have a spiritual life, we must be born again by the Holy Spirit. Therefore, you must be born by the Spirit before you were just born in flesh and you were born as a natural individual. You're here on this earth. But to be reborn, to be regenerated, is to have a spiritual birth that happens, a rebirth that happens, a regeneration. And in Romans chapter 8, verses 7 and 8, it describes this even a little bit more for us. It says it this way, For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God. That's where everybody who is born in natural flesh begins. We have a mind that's hostile to God. For it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. 
before we get spiritually regenerated, we are all we are is flesh. And, and our flesh is hostile to God, it says in Romans. It tells us the way that we are. It knows exactly how we think. Now, the flesh can mask itself and make itself pretend like it's something else in religion. The flesh can equally flaunt the laws of God and show itself to be in sin and be proud of that. But it's interesting that whether you're masking your flesh with religion or you're flaunting your flesh with sin, both at the root are seeking independence from God. And therefore, there is a callousness and a hatred, a hostility to God, according to Romans. And we're told here that that will not enter the kingdom of heaven. There is no inheritance if you do not have a rebirth, a regeneration of your spirit. And therefore, we must be born again. We must experience regeneration. We must believe that regeneration is necessary. So many times the blockages that people have to having a relationship with God is that they proudly think that they are good enough or they've done enough to actually be acceptable to God and they don't acknowledge that regeneration is necessary, not optional. So this morning, I would just challenge you, what has your thinking been? Do you need to correct your thinking according to scripture? Do you need to see that what Jesus said to Nicodemus, how is it that somebody is born again, is that it is a spiritual regeneration that is necessary for every single person on this wor- on the, in this world? Well, that's the first part of undergoing a heart procedure of regeneration. But there's a second thing that you have to do as well, and it's this. You need to write this down. Trust that regeneration is a work of God, not man. So, so we saw, first of all, that regener- we must believe that it's, regeneration is necessary, not optional. Now we see trust that re- we must trust that regeneration is a work of God, not man. In other words, I can't do it in my own strength. I'm going to need a force outside of myself to act upon me. I'm going to need my creator, God, to act upon me for regeneration, this this surgical heart procedure that is happening to actually happen. And my part in that is to trust that what he does is complete and full and everything I need for it. Simply stated, God is the surgeon, not man. You can't do a heart surgery on yourself. The image of God, though, does begin to have to shift in this illustration because no illustration is perfect, right? And so we begin to see here that as God does the surgical procedure on us, he reveals himself not only as the surgeon, but actually there's something far more important. There's a relationship. He is our actual father as well. God is not just a surgeon or obstetrician who's giving, helping birth happen here. He's actually the father that has generated new life for us to actually exist. He doesn't deliver the baby. He creates the life of the soul in, each, in every one of us. So in 1 Peter, again, we can see down in verse 23, uh, a, a, an important statement. It says this, since you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable through the living and abiding word of God, and it it continues here, but notice what that verse says. God didn't arrive at the scene of a well-formed embryo and just add, add something to it. When God works, He starts with nothing. There was no spiritual embryo. And and by the miracle of generation, God begins the life of the individual, of you and I. He doesn't deliver life. He creates new life in that instance. And therefore, John, so Peter's writing this book, John, another apostle, uh, says that when we are born again, God's seed abides in us, according to 1 John 3, 9. In other words, our Father, our Heavenly Father, His characteristics, His DNA, He's the one that has generated life in us. And then Peter says we are partakers of the divine nature in his second letter, in 2 Peter 1, verse 4, and that we are like children with traits of their father. He's talking about the spiritual new birth that happens in us. So regeneration is a work of God, not man. It's not us. And Jesus stresses this in the story with Nicodemus that we were just looking at. 
So, so just uh, again, sorry to make you flip back and forth, but if you look at John chapter three, we again see in this interaction with Nicodemus, Jesus say something incredibly important in verse eight. He says this, the wind blows where it wishes and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it, where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the spirit. This verse is stressing the sovereign freedom of God. The wind blows where it will. It doesn't blow where we want it to go. It doesn't go according to our will. The the wind being God, the spirit, uh, functions with freedom of sovereign choice of his own. It's not according to what we do. So regeneration is a work of God. It's not my choice. It's not my ability. John chapter 1 verse 13 says that we are born not of blood, nor of the will, nor of flesh, uh, or nor the will of man, but of God. So it's just very clear. Trust that regeneration is a work of God, not man. Trust that the new birth that your heart desperately needs is something that happens because of God, not because of anything of yourselves. When you begin to think, the, think about that, though, doesn't that kind of cause your heart to rejoice and worship? Because... I begin to think about my inability to actually change my heart. How so many times I I do what I don't want to do, and I don't do what I know I should be doing. And and I'm at war, and I'm enslaved, and, and I'm just at a spot where my heart is out of control, and I need somebody from the outside to act upon it. That causes me to thank whoever it is who does the work upon my heart to bring me to new life. That's God. It's amazing to think that God knows everything about you and still chooses you and calls you and sanctifies you and ignites belief in you. That's so amazing. I mean, do you stand amazed that you are a Christian? I don't think we should go a day that we don't think how amazing, how how unlikely it is that I am the one that has become a Christian. I should look with wonder and awe at the miracle of my new birth. Do you look at it that way? Remember when my children were born. And, and, and seared into my memory is the moment that each of my three children are born. It's, it's one of those moments where just the, we call it the miracle of birth will never leave my memory because of how awesome it is, how, how amazing it is. Do you think of your own spiritual birth in those same ways? I mean, when I was... Uh, help beside my wife as we were welcoming an each new child, just overwhelmed emotion, tears in my eyes. I'm not a crier, but I cried every time my kids were born because of how amazing the experience was and how, how I was being given new love for that individual. And, and listen, we should be thinking in those same ways about the new birth that we have as well. But it's possible that we don't think in those terms and that we need to be reminded that we should think in those ways. It's possible that you take so much credit for, you, for, uh, credit for it yourself that it doesn't occur to you to fall on your face and thank God that you're a Christian. It can just be so old hat, so routine, so normal that we fail to remember how awesome it is. And if that's where you are today, really this is a call for you to repent of that and to see the wonder and all again of what God has done. Uh, I, I was impacted by a uh, John Piper quote. He said, think, think on it. If you have any true spiritual desire for God, it is owing to the work of God in regeneration. If you have any love for holiness, it is owing to the work of God in regeneration. If you have any hatred for sin, it is owing to the work of God in regeneration. If you have any, a mustard seed of faith in Christ, it is owing to the work of God in regeneration. To God be the glory for our conversion to Christ. Consider it and be astounded, all you who by nature are children of wrath, that you believe in Christ and are new children of the Almighty. Regeneration is the glorious work of God, not of man. So as we undergo this heart procedure, we we see here that we need to believe that regeneration is necessary. It's not optional. Secondly, that we need to trust that regeneration is a work of God, not of man. That should cause us to worship, right? But now we need to understand one last thing. There's one more thing that we need to understand here. Write this down, number three this morning. Understand that God regenerates through his word, not without it. 
What is it that I'm encouraging you to understand? It's that God regenerates through his word, through the word of God, through the, the Bible that you're holding in your hands. That's how God does the work. The surgical instrument that God uses to give new life. Let me, let me explain what that is here. If you look at verse, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3 again, it says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope. Notice here, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is the surgical instrument, it says in verse 3. Uh, but we need to see how that instrument is used. But, but it's interesting because Peter writes a few verses later, he, he, almost something that seems to contrast until you see how it goes together. Uh, we, I already read this verse. In verse 23, it says, Since you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, notice here, through the living and abiding word of God. So, which is it? Is, is the instrument that God uses to give us new life, is it the resurrection of Jesus? Or is it, according to verse 23, uh, the living and abiding word of God? Well, what we see is that verse 25 goes on to say, but the word of the Lord remains forever, and this word is the good news that was preached to you. And here's the solution of how these things go together. How does it fit together? Uh, is, is it two instruments or one? Well, it's really one instrument. Remember, the, the gospel, the good news pr that was preached to you, uh, that gospel uh, is the message of Christ's death and resurrection for sinners. So you can't have the gospel without resurrection. And the resurrection is essential to the gospel, gospel and, and there, there would be no gospel if the resurrection was not proclaimed. The resurrection wouldn't give life to anyone if it was just kept a secret. And so what we see here is that there is an event in verse 3 called the resurrection. And then there's the announcement of the event. That's the gospel in verse 23 and 25 here. And those things work together as the instrument, the one instrument described in two ways. It's when the resurrection is preached or it's the preaching of the resurrection, that's that we see the instrument used by the surgeon to save us from our heart disease. The instrument God uses to regenerate is the gospel proclaimed from the word of God. That's what 1 Peter 23 says. It's the living and abiding word of God. And we see that the Holy Spirit blows where it will, but it never blows where the gospel is not being proclaimed. The Spirit is like the wind that blows the seed of the gospel onto the soil of man's heart and makes it come to life. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 12, it says it this way, It was revealed to them, the prophets, that they were serving not themselves but you in the things that have now been announced to you through those who preached the good news to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, Things into which angels long to look. He's talking about the gospel message, the instrument that you is used in this surgical procedure. How is the gospel preached? Well, through the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit carries the gospel and gives regenerating power to it as it falls on the hearts of men. In all of this, note what the goal of God in the work of regeneration is. Look again at verse 3. He has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. God's aim in regeneration is to create little, a little child whose hope is in the mercy of God. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So God must have a hopeful message ready for the little child to believe when new life is created by him. And that message is the good news that Jesus died and rose again for the salvation of sinners. So let me just simply end by asking you, asking you this. Do you have this hope? Do you have hope? So we've seen over these two Sundays what this hope is. We started with asking the question, what is hope? And we've seen that it's the confident assurance of a good future. It, we're talking about an eternal life with God future. We, we've talked about how we can know 
why you have, uh, we know why you have grace, uh, why you can have hope, excuse me, and that's because of grace. We're chosen, we're called, we're sanctified, we believe, we're glorified by grace. It's nothing that we do to earn it, it's simply a gift given to us. And then today we've seen how. How to have hope, it comes through regeneration. And even in that, we've come to understand that it's about believing that it's necessary, trusting that it is a work of God, that I don't do anything in it, and then understanding that it's his word that's the tool that will continue to breathe this new life, this regeneration life into me. It's, it's not something we work for. It's not something that we do things for. It, it comes down to this belief that it's necessary. I need to be saved. And I'm going to trust God that he's the one that's going to do the work. And I'm going to look to his word and recognize that he's going to breathe, breathe life over my heart in that way. If you've never before had a, a moment where your heart has been regenerated, if you've never gone through this surgical operation, spiritually speaking, sometimes we say, if you've never been born again, like I want you to know God is eager today to receive you into his family. It says in verse 3 that according to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Like he is, he can't wait for you to just raise your hand. And right now you could even just quietly, wherever you're sitting, ask God, God, would you do the work of regenerating my heart? If that's something that's never happened in your life, today is the day that he would love to give you the inheritance of salvation if you would just come to him and say, I believe it's necessary and I know you're the one who does it, nothing of me, and I'm going to trust what your word has to say to make me new in these things. So let me ask another question. How do you know that you were born? We asked it at the beginning. It could be this, this birth certificate, right? I, I could carry this around, and, uh, but that's not how people know that they're born. They know that they're born because they, they taste and they see and they smell and they're hungry and uh, we're alive, right? So let me ask you another question. How do you know you were spiritually born? How do you know that regeneration has happened within you? Well, I believe it's the same thing. Just like when I taste and smell and hungry and I'm alive, like it's these things. When I see truth in the beauty of the gospel, I know that I'm spiritually alive. When I hear the voice of God in the gospel, I know that I'm spiritually alive. I mean, for some of you, that might just have happened just a moment ago, where for the first time you heard the voice of God in the gospel, and you said, I'm ready to believe that Jesus Christ is my salvation, that he came and lived the perfect life that I could not live. He died the death that I deserved, and then he rose again, conquering death and hell so that I can have an inheritance with him. How do you know you're spiritually alive? It's when you feel the need to repent and be forgiven. It's when you're hungry for the milk and meat of God's word. It's when you breathe the air of grace in how you, uh, how you live life. It's, it's when you're alive with hope in the promises of God. Like you can't wait to see God once again in real life show his promises to be true. That's when you have a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Listen, God has caused me to be born again to a living hope. And that's why I can rise in my hope. It's nothing that I have to do. It's something that he's done. It says, according to his great mercy, he caused me to be given new life and a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We're going to learn in the coming days what that means and how that affects our head and how that affects our heart and how that affects our hands. But for now, could we just praise God Blessed be the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Rejoice in the living hope. Can we sing that together? Let me just pray and ask God to plant this deep in our hearts and then let's praise him. Heavenly Father, it is so good to have an inheritance of salvation that comes from you. Lord, we believe that you are the one that has caused us, not because of anything of ourselves. Lord, you were merciful. You didn't give us what we did deserve. Instead, you gave us the grace of new life and a living hope. And Father, we praise you. We exalt you. Uh, Lord, we thank you for all that you have done in these things. Lord, I pray for those who are teetering on the edge right now, wondering, should I put my hope in this message, the gospel of Jesus Christ? Lord, would you just, by your spirit, wash over them and put, help them to do that. Lord, for those of us who have forgotten our hope, 
Lord, would you remind us afresh by your spirit again? And Lord, in all of this, would you help our hearts to explode in the wonder and the awe and the praise of the greatness of who you are? You're our living hope, and we thank you for it. It's in Christ's name I pray. Amen.